in our meeting. Thank you. Okay, this is the following special meeting of agenda for October 20th, uh, 2015. Could I have a roll call, please? Sure. Here. 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 All president, forums president. Thank you. I'd like to emphasize that this is for informational only. Uh, there will be, uh, be two sides presenting. The Department of Lands has uh, declined to come. The, apparently the person who was most versed in this is out of town and was not available and they felt he was the best to address any kind of questions that might be raised. So we have two presenters tonight. They'll each be given 30 minutes and uh, there'll be no rebuttal. This is just 30 minutes of, of, of factual information. Uh, I would like to start by understanding that uh, before I come, I'm going to call on Mr. Paul Turk to give us a little bit of background. But before that, I'd like to read what's on your information sheet if you have not read that. So let's follow along if you like. Commonly referred to as fracking, hydraulic fracturing involves the use of water pressure to create fractures in rock that allow the oil and natural gas that contains to escape and flow up. The oil and natural gas is drawn up to a well on the surface where it is processed and refined for market. Please note that there are no current or pending applications at this time that have been submitted to the City of Yield that pertain to this subject matter. The developing law is not entirely clear what role the City of Eagle might play, might play, if any, in the regulation of fracking. The presentation will be made by representatives of the Citizens Aligned for Integrity and Accountability and the Idaho Petroleum Council. Each will be allowed 30 minutes to provide information on the subject of hydraulic fracturing in Idaho and on the end for the City of Eagle. There will be an opportunity for rebuttal, as I said before, to tonight's meeting. Representatives are welcome to contact members of the public at the conclusion of this meeting for further exchange of information. The general public will have an opportunity to comment on the information that has been provided. Three minutes will be allowed for each individual. And as always, with, with the public, we would, uh, we would like very much that you don't repeat things. If you do, if you start repeating over and over, then you really lose your audience. And that's, uh, uh, it just draws the meeting out unnaturally, and it's, uh, it's just kind of a, a redundant thing. So let's not do that. Let's be civil. Let's be uh, polite to one another and treat each other with respect. So with that, I'm going to ask Mr. Paul Turk. Let's look. First, have our, let's have our pledge of allegiance be written on that. Yeah. Let's go. I just want to give a little bit of the legal background and I apologize um, for anyone that was hoping the Department of Lands might give this presentation and as the mayor explained um, the person that was skillful in performing that role is not available this evening. The, uh, this subject matter involves a possible interplay between local authority, state law, or administrative regulation and even federal law. Um, the Idaho legislature has addressed this topic in the last year, specifically Idaho Code 47-317 um, is entitled Oil and Gas Conservation Commission Created Powers Limit on Local Restrictions. If you look at the history of that statute, it's been amended um, last year. It was amended in 20. 14, it was amended in 2013, it was amended in 2012. This is a, this is a developing area of the law. I'm not going to try to summarize what the statute says with regard to the interplay between state and local authority. Um, suffice it to say that that has not been conclusively determined, um, not in Idaho. There is a variety of litigation pending in other jurisdictions addressing virtually every aspect of fracking. Um, and perhaps some of our speakers are familiar with that and may comment on it tonight. So um, 
that just gives a, a very brief sense of kind of what the state of the law is in Idaho, the fact that it's kind of a, an evolving area of the law, and that um, the Department of Lands is heavily involved right now in administering um, the mechanisms by which fracking is going to be regulated by um, the state and by their department. Unless anyone has any questions. Any questions, Mr. Turner? Yes, Mayor. Councilman? I said I wouldn't ask one question, so I'm going to have to ask more than one. You may have five minutes. Does the law prohibit us from passing an ordinance to prohibit fracking in the city of limits? Um, well, that, the, um, without attempting a conclusive determination of what the statute says, it seems that that would be one of the safer conclusions that it does. It, it, it allows for reasonable local ordinance provisions, but arguably um, requires the city to stop short of prohibition. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Turk, I have one basic question. The question I would have for you is, can you describe for me what regulations exist to require disclosure in the event of fracking? And when I say disclosure, I mean at two levels, to the regulating public agency and or to the members of the public, either or. Can you comment on that aspect in particular? Um, I, I can't. I'm, I'm not comfortable commenting in any detail, and I'm sure our presenters can comment in better detail than I can. I, I will say that um, certainly some level of disclosure is required, and in fact there, there, has, there, there basically has to be an application. There has to be some kind of a process. Um, it's not like mowing your lawn or something that's like an inherent attribute of your property ownership. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Turner? Thank you, Mr. Turner. Thank you. Um, my name is Shelley Brock. I live at 8770 West Chaparral Road in Eagle. and a longtime Eagle resident. And I'm also a member of Citizens Ally for Integrity and Accountability. And we are the only Idaho citizens-based group that is actively fighting for our property rights and public health on this issue right now. And we're here tonight because we firmly believe that Eagle is too great to frack. At a September 22nd Eagle City Council meeting, Suzanne Budge with the Idaho Petroleum Council stated basically that there has been land leased in Ada County and it's just part of a bigger package. There are no plans for it. Well, let's take a look at her statement. This is an Idaho Department of Lands map of state-owned oil and gas leases across the Treasure Valley. And she's right. If you take a look at the little red square there, that's Eagle, and it is indeed part of a much bigger package. In fact, tens of thousands of acres have been leased across this valley, including major stretches of the Boise River, the Payette River, and the Snake River, all the way to the Oregon border, starting from Star, Black Canyon Reservoir, and Homedale all the way to the border have been leased for future drilling and fracking. The vast majority of leased land here at Eagle is state-owned split estate land. That means the surface rights have been severed from the mineral rights as per a 1923 law that was passed requiring the state to retain minerals on land they sold. And it's important to note that the mineral rights trump the surface rights. The industry gives surface owners 60 days to come to a surface agreement on minor details of this but they cannot prevent them from drilling. That's the law. Just last Friday, John Kaiserick of Alta Mesa spoke at the Interim Joint Resources Committee meeting, and he stated, and I quote, the easiest way to accumulate acreage to go and try to drill on is to lease it from the state or feds, unquote. Here are the facts. Those minerals sat there untouched since they became the property of the state nearly a century ago. Alta Mesa deliberately sought these tracts of land, nominated them to be auctioned off by IDL, and then leased the minerals. Since 2014, 3,180 acres of state-owned land have been leased in Ada County, most of that in Eagle. In the August edition of the Independent News, Alta Mesa spokesman John Foster stated that they hadn't signed any leases in Ada County but subsequent IDL records reveal that Alta, De Alta Mesa has indeed leased virtually the entire 1,380 acres. 
Here's just a little bit of that Eagle Split Estate land. This is Sedona Creek subdivision, a beautiful 40-acre subdivision on the corner of Linda Road and State Street, surrounded by three major schools and the Camille Beckman plant. Here's a couple other great big chunks of land up Eagle Road and Beacon Light. Beautiful subdivisions, hundreds of homes up there, all split estate. Here's a 640-acre parcel on Highway 16 near Firebird Raceway, dozens of homes in there. And here's a big chunk of land on Highway 16, just north of Beacon Light. It's also part of M3, and it's been leased. All this by Alta Mesa. Across the valley, many people own their own mineral rights, and Alta Mesa and a few small exploration companies have obtained some leases through di direct negotiation with the property owners, including right here in Ada County. But when that fails, they can instigate a 55% forced pooling or integration of the <coughs> mineral rights process. And Kaya is actively fighting this egregious violation of civil and property rights in Payette County as we speak. Eagle could be next on this. It's important for everyone to know that. So why are they here? Well, they're here because the Treasure Valley in most of Idaho is rich in hydrocarbon reserves. And new advances in technology in the form of well stimulation, they call it, which includes acidizing and fracking, allow them to extract oil and gas from tight sandstone and shale formations that they couldn't access before. The industry and state agencies have been saying for a long time that they're only going to do conventional drilling here. They've said they won't frack here, they can't frack here, they've said, because Idaho has no shale, only sandstone. And then the story changed a little bit. Well, okay, Idaho has shale, but it's the wrong kind of shale. It's not hydrocarbon shale. Just two weeks ago, I heard someone say that they were told that our shale just isn't thick enough to produce oil or gas. So let's look at a few of the well reports, historical well logs from the Idaho Geological Survey. And I've highlighted the word shale every time it appears in these well logs. And as you can see, for thousands of feet, every layer virtually is shale. This is in Teton County and Bonneville County in eastern Idaho. Closer to home in Elmore County, Mountain Home, same thing. Shale almost every layer down for about 3,000 feet. Payette County, Washington County, Canyon County. Everyone, same thing, thousands of feet of shale. How about right here in Eagle, just up the road on Dry Creek? This is a well that was drilled back in the 30s. 1,260 straight feet of shale before they stopped drilling because at that point they couldn't get through shale, not until they came up with fracking could they get through shale. <coughs> this is right up in the Eagle foothills, not far from where I live. Three wells were drilled up there in the 1920s. And if you read some of the details on here, and I have printouts if anyone wants to see it later up close, those hills are filled with hydrocarbon, marine origin, oil and gas producing shale, and that's why they're here in Eagle. The Idaho Petroleum Council on the front page of their website until very recently had this catchy little collage which showed Idaho's energy future front and center fracking in shale rock. If you're still not convinced, here were applications submitted by Bridge Resources who were bought out by Alta Mesa in 2011. The first wells that were drilled here in Idaho Four of them, they put right on there, if you look in the red box, they intend to frack. 85 years of conventional drilling between 1903 and 1988 proved a commercial failure here. If they could have profited from conventional drilling, they would have done so a long time ago. For Alta Mesa, fracking has been a big part of their oil and gas plays all over the country. And they specialize in stimulating flagging wells. When asked if they're going to frack, officials John Peiserick, John Foster from Alta Mesa, and Richard Brown from Alta Mesa partner Snake River Oil and Gas have stated repeatedly that they will frack, and they've said it publicly and been heard. So let's look at the difference between conventional versus non-conventional wells. Both use massive amounts of potable water, tens of thousands of gallons versus millions of gallons conventional to non-conventional. But all this water that's used becomes permanently contaminated with chemicals and radioactivity. That's water that is permanently removed from our drinking water aquifers and irrigation systems, ruined forever. The disposal of, to the disposal of toxic wastewater is equally dangerous for both conventional and non-conventional wells, whether they use wastewater pits or injection wells. The well bore integrity, that's the risk of gas leakage from these wells, is as much an issue for conventional gas as it is for frack wells. Over time, virtually all cement casings leak. Induced seismicity through injection wells occurs in both conventional and non-conventional operations. Alta Mesa has applied for class two injection wells. 
They are a documented cause of earthquake clusters in states across this nation. Flaring from both types of wells is a proven danger to communities and is a documented cause of a myriad of health problems from asthma to cancer. The risks in the supporting infrastructure are all the same. Leaking pipelines, compressor stations and refinery emissions, the destruction of roads, truck train and well pad leaks and explosions, you name it. In non-conventional wells, tight sandstone and shale formations here will require well stimulation in the form of acidizing, which is also used for conventional wells, and fracking. Acidizing, which is also sometimes called mini-fracking, uses hydrofluoric and other acids to dissolve the sandstone in order to release the hydrocarbons. You should know that the CDC classifies hydrofluoric acid as, quote, one of the most hazardous industrial chemicals in use, unquote. Hydraulic fracturing or fracking is the injection of millions of gallons of water, any of hundreds of toxic chemicals, many of them carcinogens, and sand under extremely high pressure in order to crack tight sandstone and shell formations to release the hydrocarbons. And they can run 20 to 30 legs horizontally up to nearly 10 miles long off of each frack well. When you think about how much that increases the potential for contamination of our aquifers, it's mind blowing. Do we want to see wells and wastewater pits and flaring in our front yards? Do we want methane in our tap water? Will our eagle fields look like this major Wyoming gas field in just a few years? <laughs> this is a North Dakota farm before and after fracking. Do we really want to allow this industry to turn Eagle and the Treasure Valley into their next sacrifice zone? with poisoned air and water and a backlog of lawsuits against public health, civil and property rights issues just so the industry and a handful of big property owners can profit? Are we going to negotiate what is an acceptable level of benzene for our kids to breathe or an acceptable level of methane to have running through our water pipes? <coughs> it is our responsibility as the people who live here now and for future generations to protect this place, not for just some people, but for all people. You have taken an oath to protect our health, safety, and welfare. We want to stand with you and join people from over three dozen states that have been decimated by this industry, who are linking arms to say that our rights matter. Our rights to health, safety, and welfare are the place we live, play, grow up, and grow old. Thank you. Ground water, groundwater baseline monitoring program so that they can see what their aquifers look like. Because the challenge that we have here in Idaho is that there aren't any, or there's very little hydrocarbon data as it pertains to what exists in groundwater. Very little. In fact, in some of the rural areas, probably not so much here for you guys, but in some of the outer lying areas, there's very little to no data on what our aquifers look like, hydrocarbons or not. So, you know, methane, benzene, tiling, xylene, all of those things that, that you want to look for in groundwater, the data doesn't exist. Um, so, 464, basically, um, they, you hear that it ties your hands. Um, you hear that the legislature, it's their intent to occupy the field. And in fact, I have a really good question here from, I'm assuming, I, I'm sorry, you didn't catch the gentleman's name, legal counsel. Um, our Payette County prosecutor, Anne Marie Kelso, uh, made an inquiry to Attorney General, uh, General Watson. And Attorney General Watson issued his opinion number 11 1. And is in his opinion, he basically says that he thinks that under the Local Land Use Planning Act, that you can enact ordinances that are protective and um, of both private property rights and public <coughs> health. Um, there is, um, we had a, an attorney who, it, Mark Hilty, speak in Payette County, who I think now does work for Canyon County, and he spoke before our Planning and Zoning Commission, and Mr. Hilty, who's very well versed with the Local Land Use Planning Act, basically told our commissioners that not only did they have the authority under the Local Land Use Planning Act, that it was his position that they have the responsibility under the Local Land Use Planning Act to enact a set of ordinances that are protective of the, both public health and private property rights and private property values and your infrastructure. 
all of those things that you as a city need to conduct business in and uh, keep things running smoothly. So we go on to 13, 2013, another series of bills go through um, and a couple of them are related to class two injection well. Shelly touched on that briefly. Um, right now Idaho does not have approval for class two injection wells. However, we are seeking approval as a state for class two injection wells. Uh, industry prefers to use class two injection wells because they have a myriad of exemptions from federal uh, environmental laws that allow them the ability to dispose of things in class two injection wells, which are uh, basically not constructed in such a manner as a higher class injection well. Uh, and because of these exemptions to the federal laws, they can use class two injection wells and in fact prefer to use class two injection wells. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen the news or if you've heard any of this data, um, but here's a little tidbit for you. Oklahoma now leads the country in oh, earthquakes. They have, I believe it's a, a 3.0 earthquake um, on, an, on an average of every other day. And the last set of data that I saw, which was just about a week ago, so I'm sure those numbers are higher now, they have had 500 and I think 28 earthquakes, including two weekends ago, uh, a 4.5 and a 4.8, I believe. And in 2013, I think it was, they had a 5.4 that destroyed buildings and did a lot of really uh, massive damage because Oklahoma, like Idaho, uh, doesn't have earthquake building codes, uh, as do we, at least those of us who live out in the outer lip line areas. So again, these bills were uh, declared an emergency. Um, 141 is a really uh, is a bill that we want to pay attention to because uh, from a small business owner standpoint, this one really kind of gets my goat. Um, it basically makes all of the wells that industry drills exempt from uh, personal property taxes. So they're not paying, not only are they paying one of the lowest rates of severance taxes in the country, they are exempt from personal property taxes unlike the rest of us small business owners. In 2013, um, the uh, Senate Bill 1049 was passed, and Senate Bill 1049 basically changed the composition of the oil and gas conservation. It, prior to this legislation, it was comprised of the state land board, the top five elected, elected being the key word here, officials in the state. In, with the passage of this bill, um, it created a commission with five members who were appointed by the governor. And um, one of those appointees is a gentleman by the name of Mr. Ken Smith, who was the chief financial officer for Petroglyph Energy, who did some dead <coughs> methane extraction in Dufresne County, Colorado. And this is a quote from Mr. Smith after uh, some buildings have blown up because of the high saturation of methane in their aquifers in Hufano County, Colorado. Mr. Smith represents energy interest on the Idaho Oil and Gas Conservation Commission. Mr. Smith would be a gentleman who is making decisions on everything that comes before the Idaho Oil and Gas Conservation Commission. So we move on to 2014. 2014, another emergency. <laughs> um, this one talks about clarifying the definition of oil and gas and pipelines versus gathering lines. A lot of people don't understand that there is a definite difference there. Industry will stand up here, and I'm sure the Petroleum Council, I'm going to guess, is going to stand up here and talk about how heavily re regulated those pipelines are and how there are all these federal laws that exist to protect um, citizenry. The reality is, is that those gathering lines are not heavily regulated. And in fact, following a meeting um, on August 10th in Payette, I had a very interesting conversation with Rhonda Lauberman, who is a regulatory coordinator for Alta Mesa, who informed me that the 11 miles of gathering lines <coughs> that they run through Payette County, including on the other side of that bridge, right here, Black's Bridge, uh, do not contain Mercaptan. 
where captain is the odorant that is required, that's that rotten egg smell that you smell if you have a natural gas leak or you're, God forbid, in the area of a pipeline leak or explosion, you smell that rotten egg smell, hopefully you'll smell it. Um, but the gathering lines, apparently, they are not required to have Mer Captain running in those lines. So we have 11 miles in Cayet County, including lines running underneath the other side of this bridge at Black's Bridge on the back side of New Plymouth, up river from the city of Fruitland water intake valve, that if something goes south, we're not going to have an ability to, to, to know it, to smell it, until things start bubbling or go boom. That's how heavily regulated they are. 2014. So we've got more, uh, more. I'm not going to bore you guys. It's a, so, so, and I apologize, apologize to you guys because I know this is really dry content. But it's super important to know. I thought, Kaya thought, uh, our members felt like everybody needed to know this legislative history, how we came to be where we're at today, because this is a roadmap for where we're going to be if our local cities and counties don't step up to protect their citizens. Um, there, again, property tax exemption, declared an emergency. This one would provide a retroactive application. Um, this one, House Bill 125, I was actually really, this one kind of still puzzles me because our District 9 Senator Abby Lee carried this bill and it changed the definition of uh, the wet gas, which is a condensate, to a dry gas. Well, dry gas prices, for those of you who follow those markets, are in the basement and have been for quite some time. The wet gas is way more valuable and expensive. Um, but this bill was presented that it was going to put more, bring more money in Idaho's coffers. So I would really, if anybody in the, in the audience can make that math work, I'd love to see it because <laughs> it doesn't work for me. Um, House Bill 269 talks about uh, how the taxes is going to be, you know, that $183 that the Payette County made, how it's going to be distributed. Um, House Bill 49 talks about more about fees and what have you. That bill actually had a little bit of good in it. They increased fees, not nearly uh, as much as they should have to be protective of public health, but um, it, they did increase it somewhat. Um, 2015. Um, you've got, this is the, the, a whole slew of bills came through in 2015. 123 is a biggie. Uh, 123 has to do with when you, are, when you are brought before the Idaho Oil and Gas Conservation Commission, how that hearing will be held. Because that hearing process is, is under the uh, Administrative Procedures Act. So you are not necessarily it's not necessarily considered a contested case. And in fact, in this bill says, not only is it not a contested case, but unless the, the, com the commission specifically says, we're going to handle this as a contested case, it is not. So the laws of the, the, and I'm not an attorney, I will put this out there. As I understand it, what that means is that those parliamentary laws, those laws that apply in a court of law, do not necessarily apply when it is not a contested case. They are way more lax. For example, um, ex parte communications can't happen. And in fact, it already happened in our case that we're challenging for the forced pooling applications that are going on in Kaya County right now, not once but twice. Um, House Bill 48 um, is a really pretty fascinating one. House Bill 48 talks about, it makes their production records confidential. And for quite some period of time, basically a year. And I would, the reason that that strikes me is because we're talking about, in a lot of cases, the people's resources. Those resources belong to we the people. We the people via the state of Idaho, or we the people via the federal government. But, but in a lot of cases, we the people. So um, I find it highly ironic that there's all of this confidentiality related to production records over resources that we the people collectively own. Um, 
This talks about spacing units, House Bill 124. This is real important, you guys, because this is what you're going to hear. Your industry is going to come up here and they're going to say, we can only drill one well every 640 acres. That is not the case. They can drill however many wells in however tight a spacing they want to. And in fact, they have already done so out in the Little Willow Field in Payette County. All they have to do is request exceptional location spacing. When they request exceptional location spacing, then they get the rubber stamp of ID out and they can put those wells much tighter spacing than one every 640 acres. Um, this is House Bill 50. This is industry's crown jewel, you guys. This is a bill that allows them to force you to do things that you don't want to do. This is the bill that says if industry gets 55% of the mineral rights in a section, they can submit an integration, as they call it. We prefer to call it what it is, which is forced pulling. Ms. They, Edwin, that concludes your 30 minutes. Please summarize briefly. Oh, absolutely. Thank you, Mayor. I'm sorry, I was trying to look at the, the perfect timing. That is, that's pretty much the last. Forced pooling, we have integration applications. We that two of them that have been filed. Kaya is challenging them. We do not think that they are uh, constitutional, quite frankly. Um, that anybody wants to learn about that, they can tell us. They can come visit us. I appreciate your time. One of the things that I will quickly point out here, and thank you for your indulgence, in the back of your binder, and I did not have time to talk about this, but you will find a compendium, and it is a compendium that was put together by the New York Health Professionals and the Physicians for Social Responsibility. It is 151 pages of 639 peer-reviewed studies. Most have been done in the last two years on oil and gas drilling activities as it relates to public health. And I thank you for your time. Thank you very much for allowing me to be here today. My name is Paul Powell. I live at 13061 North Andy's Gulch Road in Hidden Springs. Uh, I'm representing Idaho Petroleum Council, I'm the vice president of that association, industry association, which uh, is made up of leaders in the oil and gas exploration, production, uh, transportation uh, industry. <coughs> and our main goal is. One goal is to make sure that we have, uh, or to encourage consistent, uh, you know, regulatory framework across uh, producing states, uh, so we don't have a hodgepodge of different regulations as much as possible. And the other major focus we have is to uh, be a resource for elected official, officials, policymakers, uh, and the public as we deal as this new industry, this infant, is in its infant stages here in Idaho, uh, moves forward. Uh, and myself, I'm president of Petroglyph Energy, which is a Boise headquartered oil and gas exploration and production company. We have uh, uh, wells primarily in the state of Utah, about 600 wells in Utah and some in North Dakota. Uh, and uh, we have to operate there in the UNA Basin in northeastern Utah that's been producing oil and natural gas since 1948, uh, commercially feeding uh, five refineries in the Salt Lake City area. Uh, I would point out that we, Petroglyph Energy do not have any leases, wells, or field operations in the state of Idaho. Uh, we just happen to live here. Our parent company uh, owned Intermountain Gas for about 30 years. So uh, we love Idaho and uh, right next door to Eagle here. If you can if you indulge me, sometimes a picture's worth a thousand words. I have like a five minute video on how an oil well is drilled and completed and fracked. And I think uh, that would give us a basis for uh, discussions going forward, if I may. Geologists have known for years that substantial deposits of oil and natural gas were trapped in deep shale formations. These shale reservoirs were created tens of millions of years ago. Around the world today, with modern horizontal drilling techniques and hydraulic fracturing, the trapped oil and natural gas in these shale reservoirs is being safely and efficiently produced, gathered, and distributed to customers. 
Let's look at the drilling and completion process of a typical oil and natural gas well. Shale reservoirs are usually one mile or more below the surface, well below any underground source of drinking water, which is typically no more than 300 to 1,000 feet below the surface. Additionally, steel pipes, called casing, cemented in place, provide a multi-layered barrier to protect freshwater aquifers. During the past 60 years, the oil and gas industry has conducted fracture stimulations in over 1 million wells worldwide. The initial steps are the same as for any conventional well. A hole is drilled straight down using freshwater-based fluids, which cools the drill bit, carries the rock cuttings back to the surface, and stabilizes the wall of the well bore. Once the hole extends below the deepest freshwater aquifer, the drill pipe is removed and replaced with steel pipe, called surface casing. Next, cement is pumped down the casing. When it reaches the bottom, it is pumped down and then back up between the casing and the borehole wall, creating an impermeable additional protective barrier between the well bore and any freshwater sources. In some cases, depending on the geology of the area and the depth of the well, additional casing sections may be run and, like surface casing, are then cemented in place to ensure no movement of fluids or gas between those layers and the groundwater sources. What makes drilling for hydrocarbons in a shale formation unique is the necessity to drill horizontally. Vertical drilling continues to a depth called the kickoff point. This is where the well bore begins curving to become horizontal. One of the advantages of horizontal drilling is that it's possible to drill several wells from only one drilling pad, minimizing the impact to the surface environment. When the targeted distance is reached, the drill pipe is removed, and additional steel casing is inserted through the full length of the well bore. Once again, the casing is cemented in place. For some horizontal developments, new technology in the form of sliding sleeves and mechanical isolation devices replace cement in the creation of isolations along the well bore. Once the drilling is finished and the final casing has been installed, the drilling rig is removed and preparations are made for the next steps, well completion. The first step in completing the well is the creation of a connection between the final casing and the reservoir rock. This consists of lowering a specialized tool called a perforating gun, which is equipped with shaped explosive charges, down to the rock layer containing oil or natural gas. This perforating gun is then fired, which creates holes through the casing, cement, and into the target rock. These perforating holes connect the reservoir and the wall bore. Since these perforations are only a few inches long and are performed more than a mile underground, the entire process is imperceptible on the surface. The perforation gun is then removed in preparation for the next step, hydraulic fracturing. The process consists of pumping a mixture of mostly water and sand, plus a few chemicals, under controlled conditions into deep underground reservoir formations. The chemicals are generally for lubrication, to keep bacteria from forming, and help carry the sand. These chemicals typically range in concentrations from 0.1 to 0.5% by volume and help to improve the performance of the stimulation. This stimulation fluid is sent to trucks that pump the fluid into the well bore and out through the perforations that were noted earlier. This process creates fractures in the oil and gas reservoir rock. The sand in the frac fluid remains in these fractures in the rock and keeps them open when the pump pressure is relieved. This allows the previously trapped oil or natural gas to flow to the well bore more easily. This initial stimulation segment is then isolated with a specially designed plug, and the perforating guns are used to perforate the next stage. This stage is then hydraulically fractured in the same manner. This process is repeated along the entire horizontal section of the well, which can extend several miles. Once the stimulation is complete, the isolation plugs are drilled out and production begins. Initially water, and then natural gas or oil, flows into the horizontal casing and up the well bore. In the course of initial production of the well, approximately 15 to 50% of the fracturing fluid is recovered. This fluid is either recycled to be used on other fracturing operations, or safely disposed of according to government regulations. The whole process of developing a well typically takes from three to five months. A few weeks to prepare the site, 
four to six weeks to drill the well, and then one to three months of completion activities, which includes one to seven days of stimulation. But this three to five month investment can result in a well that will produce oil or natural gas for 20 to 40 years or more. When all of the oil or natural gas that can be recovered economically from a reservoir has been produced, work begins to return the land to the way it was before the drilling operations commenced. <laughs> and pipes cut off three to six feet below ground level. All surface equipment will be removed, and all pads will be filled in with dirt or replanted. The land can then be used again by the landowner for other activities, and there will be virtually no visual signs that a well was once there. Today, hydraulic fracturing has become an increasingly important technique for producing oil and natural gas in places where the hydrocarbons were previously inaccessible. Technology will continue to be developed to improve the safe and economic development of oil and gas resources. Mayor, members of the council, uh, thank you for indulgence on that video. Although uh, I recognize it's the only one I had, I recognize it's not exactly the kind of drilling that's being done out in Fayette County uh, as far as uh, them doing uh, vertical wells and, and uh, not fracking the well. But since that's the topic I was asked to speak to you about tonight, uh, fracking, I'll focus on that. Um, So what phase are we at in the life cycle of oil and gas in this industry in Idaho currently? Uh, as I think uh, the prior speaker mentioned, uh, there was an exploration phase that's gone on for about 100 years, from early 1900s to the early 2000s. There were about 150 uh, wells drilled in the state of Idaho, uh, none of which uh, were economic, uh, to my knowledge. Uh, and then more recently, we've had uh, the discoveries out in Payette County of uh, gas at about 5,000 feet and sandstone formations. And so you kind of move from the exploration phase of trying to find something. Once you think you found something, uh, the next step is well, I'll call the land rush, but it's basically you, uh, before competition rolls in, you want to leave, get as, uh, your hands on as many mineral leases, as much land as possible. And, and the former speaker was correct that uh, you do look for the biggest blocks, whether it be from state, uh, federal, or large landowners. Uh, to accumulate as much uh, as possible. Now what you don't know at this point, you know you think you found something, you don't know whether that land is going to end up being productive or not, uh, or what's uh, affectionately known as the industry as goat pasture. But you need to then move to the commercialization and actually uh, prove that you have commercial uh, sellable product. Uh, that's the phase I understand, to my, that I understand all the is in at this point. Uh, and, but once you've got that pilot area and you've commercialized it, now you've got to start the geologic assessment to see how, how big is this resource and what you have and what might be uh, effective for lands uh, and before you then kind of work your way out and expand and develop. But I think that's uh, one very key point since this development is currently uh, centered out uh, in Payette County, uh, you know, there's times we'll kind of watch that grow, see how that unfolds. Uh, it, it's uh, quite a ways from here in Eagle, and you don't just hopscotch around the country because with the gas field, you got to lay uh, you know, pipe and transmission lines to get it to, to market. So uh, there's a, a period of growth, expansion, of developing the resource, developing the infrastructure, uh, and then eventually competition rolls in, industry matures, and, and grows. And so. Uh, it's, it's important to know where we are in that process. Now, when you ask the question, how is this going to be developed? How, how do you go about deciding how to do it? In my opinion, you know, it's, it's all in the rocks because uh, the hydrocarbons are in sedimentary rock, typically laid down in a marine environment. And it's either, often either sandstones or shales. Well, there's quite a difference. I mean, this is an example of sandstones that we're producing oil from over in Utah. And it's very important to note that the oil is not in a pool underground, it's in the pores of the rock. 
and the oil or gas flows through the pores of those rocks, and that's it's called permeability. So if the pores are connected and the oil or gas can flow through, you have permeability, and it may be enhanced further if there's a natural fracturing in the rock. But uh, it's it's uh, the, we, the type of development folks will do here in Idaho is based on what the rocks tell them. And if you have high permeability, uh, uh, you don't need to frack. If you don't have high permeability, good flow through the path, uh, then you would then you would normally frack. But we're in Utah. Uh, we drill by 60 wells a year, uh, frack every one of them, and that's, uh, I don't know of one in the Uinta Basin that uh, has been drilled and not, and not completed with hydraulic fracturing. But when you have that, the result of that porosity and the ability to drain the gas or oil through the rock, you end up with what's called drainage area. And that's where you get to well spacing, whether you can uh, a gas well could drain 640 acres or not. Um, you know, often with oil wells, it's probably just typically 40 acres is a standard state spacing. Uh, and, but those rocks will dictate the drilling and completion techniques, whether it's most cost effective or efficient, drill a vertical well, drill a horizontal well, uh, hydraulically fracture it, don't hydraulically fracture it. It's, uh, uh, you know, that if you want to follow what the industry is going to do, you follow the rocks because that, that uh, tells you everything. And the part of the key is, it's ultimately about economics. Because industry is not going to do something just because it's possible they're going to do it if it makes sense and makes, makes money. When we drill typical oil well over in Utah, cost a million dollars a piece, about 30% of that is a hydraulic fracture. So it's, it's a significant decision and it's not an immaterial amount to your rate of return, whether you need to employ more expensive techniques or not. And simply the decision of whether you drill a vertical well or a horizontal well, uh, if you drill a vertical well in a week, it takes you a month to drill a horizontal well, your burn rate's about $40,000 a day. So it's a material difference uh, in, in uh, there are a lot of techniques available. The issue, as I point out, is finding the technique that fits the resource that you're developing uh, here in Idaho. Obviously, from prior presentation and others, there's myriad questions that get raised when, particularly when the industry is new in a given area. Uh, there's obviously questions about hydraulic fracturing. And I've heard horizontal fracking, which frankly there's no difference in how technically you do a, a vertical uh, hydraulic fracturing job in a horizontal other than how you handle the gravity uh, when you're on well bores on the side. Obviously, people, everyone's concerned with water quality, or uh, integration issues, split state issues. So there's a number of things to be educated on. There's always a point of view, and the key point is there are numerous states, and even next door in Utah where we operate, <coughs> been through all these, nothing new here. It's all been addressed, and there's uh, you can just look uh, look to the neighbors and see how it's being done, and, and it's been there and handled before. So it's. It's nothing new. Now, I'm talking about hydraulic fracturing specifically. You saw in the video, it's all about using uh, water pressure uh, to create the fracture, fill it with sand so the rock doesn't uh, press back together. And you're creating, instead of you think of the permeability of the rock, like the surface streaks here, and maybe some natural fractures like Highway 44, what you're trying to do is create that uh, I-84 that connects those other uh, pathways to your well bore. The issue is how much of your rock is uh, connected to your well bore. Uh, brief history, well stimulation goes back to the 1860s. Uh, I think it was uh, dropping nitroglycerin down well to kind of shake things up a bit. Uh, hydraulic fracturing was uh, experimental use was in 1947. Commercial use began in 1949. Currently, there are 1.2 uh, million, more than 1.2 million wells that have been completed with hydraulic fracturing, and over 90% of the wells drilled today uh, are completed with hydraulic fracturing. So it's it's not new. It's, it's uh, being done every day, and it's interesting if you've been in the industry a while that 
fracking is a term that seems to be fairly new to the uh, public vocabulary, but like I say, it's, it's been around for decades. It's been uh, used for decades. <coughs> now, what is this fluid that gets pumped in the ground, what does it consist of? I gave you a handout there that's a little easier to read, uh, but basically 99.5% 9, water and sand. Uh, some of the chemicals that are included, uh, biocides, so you don't introduce bacteria into the formation, uh, thickening agents like chlor, <coughs> Uh, you know, which would be a thickening agent, agent used in salad dressing and other uh, things. So you can see what is what are these different things used for? What are they? Is the purpose of fracking? But then also, what is the you know common household use for these different items? And the question was asked earlier: Do you report have some way of reporting what gets put in these wells? And that's true. Frackfocus.org is a website where industry uses to uh, post the Every, all the components that went into that uh, crack job, uh, you can look, you know, search by state, by county, by specific well. Uh, every well we fractured, there's a, a one page with exactly what the percentage, what the compound was that is in that, that frack job. So it is, uh, you, you have to report it to the state. The state requires us in Utah to report it on frackfocus.org so that the general public can access the data. So is uh, hydraulic fracturing only used for oil and gas? Uh, it's actually used, uh, has been used in stimulating uh, some water wells, geothermal wells. But interestingly enough, it's uh, used by EPA as a, a tool, a remediation tool in their Superfund cleanup sites as well. So it's uh, not just an oil and gas uh, process. It, it has other useful uses. But ultimately, the issue is, is it safe? Is it, uh, or are there all these, you know, uh, problems that are just waiting to come down the road? And if you look at our top regulators and what they say about hydraulic fracturing, like EPA Administrator Jim McCarthy, there's nothing inherently dangerous in fracking that sound engineering practices can't accomplish. Or uh, Interior Secretary Sally Jewell, fracking's been done safely for decades. There's no doubt that this essential tool will be used for decades to come. Or Secretary Moniz, I still have not seen any evidence of fracking, per se, contaminating groundwater. And I would encourage you, as you go through in educating yourself through this whole process, uh, for every scary picture, there's a story. And, you know, as a simple example, one of the, you know, iconic uh, images from the movie Gasland was the guy lighting his, uh, you know, water, tap water's kitchen sink on fire. Well, there's a story behind every one of those. In that particular case in Well County, Colorado, uh, Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission investigated that. Uh, the insinuation it was due to fracking, uh, deep gas exploration in the area. Turns out, when you look at the drilling report from the guy's water well, drilled through four different uh, layers of coal, coal seams, and coal seams are full of methane, and the methane sure is in the water well, but it was uh, not there due to fracking or uh, deep gas exploration, actually it was biogenic. When they ran tests on the, the isotopic analysis of the gas, you can tell the difference between biogenic gas and thermogenic gas. Thermogenic being buried deep underground in temperature and pressure, the uh, organic matter is cooked into either oil or gas over time. Uh, biogenic is more like what the uh, Ada County landfill is collecting and burning off the landfill. So. There's a, a distinct fingerprint to the type of gas. So there's a the point being not to debunk every every myth in there, but every scary picture has a story, just like every dispute that comes before you here at the council chambers from time to time. And we just have to dig under the covers and understand the story and how has it been handled in states previously, and how is it why is it that all of these uh, key regulators in our country are saying this is a safe process, it's been done safely, and it will continue to be done safely for decades. So uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Sure. Yeah, I'd like to know how much money the uh, gas and oil industry plans on setting aside uh, once they leave and, and are gone, it's gonna deal with the problems that we're gonna be left with. Mm -hmm. The reason I say that is, uh, uh, the gentleman didn't uh, discuss the, uh, the the man in, in Utah uh, who allowed drilling on his property 
and uh, contaminated the water in the entire valley. So if we're left with that, what kind of money are they going to leave to take care of that? Sure. Please let us come as three minutes. Sure. Uh, Tom Servino, 2773 North Tangaroos uh, Drive here in Eagle. Um, two quick points I want to make. Um, one is that Alta Mesa is financially unstable. Um, their 10Q report for June uh, 2015 uh, reports that they are 200 million of more liabilities than assets, so they have negative equity. Um, they're, that was right before the fuel and oil prices dropped, so I imagine it's worse now, but their September financial won't be available till November. Um, important to know that they just sold in October um, some assets to cover $150 million of debt. Um, as you all know, no one's running to Dakota, everyone's running away from the Dakotas. So uh, this is going to be an interesting scenario. I, I imagine that they may not move forward too much just because of their situation, but. Um, in any event, I would think that someone who's financially unstable may be someone you want to watch a little closer. Uh, second, most important, um, I want to read just the paragraph from 464. Uh, no ordinance, resolution, requirement, or standard of a city, county, or political subdivision, except a state agency with authority, that's the Oil and Gas Commission, shall actually or operationally prohibit the extraction of oil and gas. So that answers your question, I believe, and it's right in the law. Um, provided, however, that extraction may be subject to reasonable local ordinance provisions, uh, not repugnant to the law. So just so you know, my CCNRs are repugnant to the law because they don't allow fracking or well drilling on our property, that those are no longer uh, valid CCNRs. Which, okay, so uh, not repugnant to the law, which protect public health public safety, public order, or which prevent harm to public infrastructure, or, and the most important, degradation of the value, use, and enjoyment of private property. So you are allowed to pass ordinances, and you might say, well, which ordinances should we pass to do that without saying we can't you know, drill? Um, but I think there are many ordinances that can be passed with regards to use of roads, um, access, um, public safety, uh, I'm looking for accountability, and that's all I'm looking for. Not a scientist, I'm an accountant. So uh, I'd like to see some accountability with regards to what it was forward. Thank you. Sure. My name is Gabby O'Gara, and I live at 1228 East Prairie View Drive here in Eagle. I would like to thank you for inviting us here so we could educate ourselves and hear what has to be said from the parties that have presented tonight. And I would just like to say that we elected you because we look forward to your advocating for us, and keeping us informed and educated, and that's what you're doing tonight. And I look forward to your continuing to do that because I know that this is a really important issue for everyone that's chosen to live in Eagle for the quality of life and the environment that we like to live in for ourselves, for our children to live in, and for our grandchildren to hopefully grow up in. I can speak for myself and my neighbors that we don't want fracking here. I'm not a scientist, but I know that they can do fracking in other places that love the idea of fracking, and they embrace fracking, and that's great for those people who live in those places. I don't want fracking where I live, and I don't think my neighbors want fracking where they live either. And there is a story behind every picture. I, when I heard that, I did think of like the Exxon Valdez disaster. There's a story behind that picture. It was sad. It was a sad story. And I don't want to see any stories in my environment here repeated that remind me of anything that devastating. So thanks for what, Thank you. what you do and your work, and we appreciate it. I know this is an emotional issue, but I'd ask you this in a public forum. Please hold your applause. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Michael Olson. I'm 905 North Valley Bellow Way here at Eagle. Two things. Oil gas guy conveniently, conveniently did not address property rights or forest pooling. That was not part of this presentation. Secondly, if the industry has no plans to drill for that or sport evil, then why not give up the leases and move on? Thank you. Captain Maslap, 4028 North Donald Way in Meridian. I noted that in the presentation, it said that 15 to 57% of the chemicals pumped in are recovered. 
the rest of those chemicals we have to deal with for decades. And I'm not in favor of that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would just like to make a mention as to what value the state and our legislators put on our water resources here in Idaho, which is one of the most prized possessions that we have. The Snake River Aquifer flows from the east, it heads west. Any contamination that's done will move that way towards the west. They talk about the fact, the gentleman from the oil and gas industry, about the fact that uh, they drill beneath these aquifers. That is not entirely true. I have numerous articles from the US Geological Survey that talk about contaminated well water aquifers as a result of fracking. And also the gentleman stated about the types of chemicals that they use to inject are far more than what he has stated. They're in the five to six, seven hundred range of chemicals and types of chemicals that are used. Uh, I have also some articles by the US Geological Survey that I would like to give the council. I believe, Mayor, I've given you them previously, and it will deal with the causes of earthquakes as a result of the fracking. We have numerous faults that are uncharted out here in Emmett and the surrounding foothills due to lack of funding from the US Geological Survey to get the grants to be able to find out what we actually have in the foothills and out towards Emmett. I can state that if you go to the US uh, Geological Survey and or the Idaho State Geological Survey, you can look up past historic earthquakes for Idaho. Uh, a nice one that occurred back in, uh, I believe back in May of 1916, was strong enough to be felt, was centered out in was strong enough to be felt in southwest Montana, all the way to the whole central and eastern part of Oregon. Now for something to cause that type of shaking would require something in the range of about a 6.0 earthquake at least. I used to be involved with earthquake prediction through Stanford Research Institute. I was also a good friend of one of our, one of the head geologists for the uh, Santa Clara County, which encompassed San Jose. He's now since retired Jim Berkman, and I learned quite a bit from him. I'm not stating I'm a geologist, I'm sort of an amateur, but I do know that the fracking, if it is done here, will cause and trigger, as it is done back in Oklahoma, the earthquakes that we now see back there. Several years ago, you did not see what is going on now back in Oklahoma. Uh, if you go to the U.S. Geological Survey, which I do two or three times a day, you can see, as a result of fracking, what it has done back there. The damage to foundations, to chimneys, to cracked uh, homes, the, the industry is not paid for any of this. Uh, that's pretty much what I have to say. Thank you. East Trailside Drive. Um, two questions. How many... Uh, for some, in Shelley, in the audience, or Alma, how many wells are currently in Payette County? Seventeen. Oh, I heard it was fourteen or fifteen, so that's quite a few. And then, pardon me. Okay. And then another question. I think you had a slide, Alma, but it went by really fast. There was another meeting. Um, was it November seventh? Fourth. November fourth. November fourth. And what time? And where is it? Yeah. 7 p.m. at Eagle High School, so that slide flashed really fast, so I just wanted to alert people to that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> Members of the Council, uh, my name is John Friend. I live at 2300 East Buckskin Court. Um, the first thing I need to admit is this is much more technical than I understand at all. Um, I've, read, I've seen the news, I've read the news, I've, I've uh, uh, learned of North Dakota and, and other things that are happening. And in light of that, I, my guess is, is probably 95% of us sitting in here um, are in my same position. We're interested, but we really don't know. So what I'd like, to, the thought that's gone through my mind, and I would like to suggest, and I see Commissioner Case is here, I'll put him on the spot, but I would like to suggest a working group that would consist of the City of Eagle, Ada County, uh, the Department of Lands, 
and uh, probably the 8th County Highway District, at least initially, because one of the problems I understand that has taken place in North Dakota was um, just a significant amount of large truck traffic that took place. And there are probably other um, organizations and agencies that, that should be involved in that work group. And I know this is, this is ahead of anything happening here, but I think that's what's important is to get a hold of the curve, get ahead of the curve. And um, um, I think for us to become educated and ready for what might come, whether it comes in five years or ten years, uh, would be very important. So thank you, Mr. Jones. Thank you. Sir, do you have a hand up over there that issue? Uh, I'm going to see your hand. <clears throat> Melvin Satterwhite, 1628 North Morton Place, just up the road. Um, <clears throat> while we've heard considerable discussions about um, drilling and, uh, and an environment of 5,000 plus feet from the surface, my background comes from that of terrestrial environment. And um, in the past, we had to worry about ducks landing on the ponds in North and South Dakota. Uh, and transmitting the residual oil surrounding the, the pond that water is sitting on the pond. Does it look like a pond to them? It was crude oil sitting in these catchment basins. I don't hear, didn't hear anything from the gentleman discussing how they're going to contain the liquid that comes out. He shows it maybe going back into a truck, but there's always <coughs> uh, There's always contamination. Uh, once that's on the soil, that begins to move vertically and laterally. Uh, it doesn't stay in place unless it becomes a solid. And um, it begins to move and eventually will contaminate uh, soil, contaminate uh, subsurface environment. And then you have to remove that material and put it someplace. Putting it into the Ada County um, uh, uh, dump landfill just moves it from point A to point B. You still have a hydrocarbon that you have to take care of. And <clears throat> probably if you delve into the EPA reports, when I was looking at all the EPA reports and water quality years ago, a little bit of, uh, of uh, hydrocarbons goes a long way in causing a health issue. And back then, people were just dumping their heavy metals into, into streams, the dyes from the dye industry in the streams, just letting them float on down. Next guy's problem. We shouldn't have that issue here. And the school over here should not have their, we should not have our children breathing the aromatics coming off the pot, coming off the pond, or coming away from the coming away from the drilling operation. So how are we going to control that? And then we're talking about, I saw the pipes on the surface, the collection pipes. How do you can control those so that high pressure eventually doesn't break them or through adverse environment, they get broken and they have spills. Fortunately, the option about these where I did spend a little bit of time, nature took care of it. And for the most part, when I was there, it was gone. Surface, aside from the money they spent on it. So microorganisms will take care of a lot of this if you let them do that. But then we have to sit around and, uh, and breathe the aromatic. Thank you. Yes. Who else would like to speak? the public testimony and with the pleasure of the council. I would like to say that we have given us a lot of information tonight, a lot to think about. Uh, I like the idea of a working group. We'll be working on that, I believe, with the agreement of the council. And we'll be sharing our thoughts and your thoughts with uh, not only the legislature, but the governor himself. I uh, appreciate it. Thank you for all your coming tonight. And do we have a business before us this evening? Uh, Mr. Mayor, I think uh, with the recommendation that Mr. Friend made, uh, Maybe we should add uh, 
um, like the Division of Water Quality and uh, people like that to a working group that might uh, help us understand some of the other issues that have come up, not, not just as elected officials, but appointed officials. Uh, the only one thing I can think is years ago when I was working in Henderson, Nevada, a big auto mall was coming into town and I was a city planner there. <clears throat> and there were a lot of people against the auto mall because of the impact it would have on the city of Henderson. And uh, so we as planners were writing all kinds of conditions to condition it out. And the people who were against it came in and pointed out a very good point that the auto mall was actually controlled by Middle Eastern money. Nothing against the Middle East, I'm just saying it had a lot of money behind it. And the point was, no matter what conditions you put on there, no matter how extreme, if we ultimately end up with conditions versus prohibition, I think there's a lot of money behind this group, and I think as a council, whether I'm sitting here or not, I don't know how long the committee will take to work on this, but I think we really need to consider the fact that there's a lot of money behind this operation. Condition, 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 the money will get around it. So I think we really need to think about prohibition. Thank you. presentations for all of your public comment. Um, before we move on any working committee, I personally want a chance to visit with the Idaho Department of Lands. I want to ask some very specific questions based on some research that I've done, some concerns that I have. And so I would ask that we not <coughs> define a working committee until perhaps take it under advisement and maybe do it in a week's time at the upcoming council meeting or shortly thereafter. But I would like some time to take this under advisement, visit with the Department of Lands, and make sure that we have a comprehensive list of people that need to contribute to this working committee. I think we have a lot of reading to do and a lot of understanding to do, but I have to agree with that. So if there are no other comments, we'll conclude our reading. Thank you. Thank you all for coming.